we have a keynote, securing applications from vulnerabilities with zero trust. So in order to protect against the evolving threat landscape, we must change the way in which we protect our data against vulnerabilities. To adapt, organizations are operating with a framework that no, new, no user, network or device can be trusted by default until proven otherwise. And to help us take us through this journey will be Seamus Lennon, who's a solutions engineer at ThreatLocker. So Seamus, Thank welcome you. on board. We have a clicker here for you. Perfect. The stage is yours. The team will just change over the presentation for you. The present Here we go. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Seamus Lennon. I'm a solution engineer with Trellocker, the EMEA team. So today I'm gonna try to explain how to secure applications from vulnerabilities with a zero trust approach, okay? So I'm gonna start off very basic and just talk about applications themselves. So we'll start talking about what applications are. Basically, software. The software that we use every day be it Microsoft Office, Google Chrome, sharing tools like Dropbox, software we use in and out every single day. Now, not only do we use them just in, a, in an office environment, a production environment, software is used everywhere. So software is used in operating theaters. It's used on airlines to track airlines, ambulance tracking services. It's even used in rocket engines. So what software is, it's just code that has been compiled and executed. So when we look at software, really the possibilities of software are endless. We can use them for great things. However, there is a problem because softwares, whether the code is good or bad, are not always secure. So from the standpoint of the developer, it depends on what way you consider good or bad. If you're looking at software from a hacking point of view and you've developed a ransomware and it runs effectively, well, from that developer, it's a good piece of software. As a victim, it's not good software, it's bad software. So when it comes to software and how we're looking at applications these days, what we will look at is how attackers are using these softwares that we have today. So when we're looking at the landscape of software, Last year, there was over 20,000 CVEs reported for software. That's common vulnerabilities and, and exposures. That's where software has been identified with a hole in it that had to be patched, that could have been used to gain access to that environment or gain access to that machine. So far this year, there's been 7,000 reported CVEs alone, just on this year alone. There is data out there now that shows that the growth of attacks from the web is increasing 10% year on year. So this is only just getting worse day by day, year by year. The more we use software in our day-to-day -day lives, the more software vulnerabilities there are gonna be out there. So just to talk about these particular CVEs and what explain what they actually are okay so I'll just go through a, a, a couple of them the first one I'd like to go through is called the print nightmare okay not sure if anybody's ever heard of the print nightmare a lot of people have so the print nightmare basically effectively what it was is there's a Windows service on each and every endpoint called the print spooler sp service now as most people never know about the print spooler service until things stop printing and they go into their printer and there's a whole list of items there ready to print, but they don't print, even though there's nothing wrong with the printer. The only way to fix it is to restart our servers. Now, the vulnerability that affected the print spooler service was it allowed the injection of a DLL, a shared DLL, and using a Metaspoil, you could actually execute remote code on the machine. Not only could you execute remote code on that machine, you could actually run it with, with escalated privileges. In other words, without even having access to a machine, you are able to run code on that machine 
as an administrator of that device. With typical environments, particularly large organizations, you may have print servers, which are connected to a domain, which have access to all of the re rest of the network. So it was a huge vulnerability. Now Microsoft did release a patch for this. Initially, the patch actually only solved the remote execution of code. And initially, the patch only actually solved the problem for only certain versions of Windows 10 and certain versions of Windows Server, not them all. So it took a long time for this to get actually resolved. The next one I'd like to talk about was one that came around in December 2021, not so long ago, Log4j. If anybody ever in, in the room manages servers or server environments, they'll know the nightmare about this one. So if you don't know what Log4j is, Log4j is essentially a logging tool for Java-based applications. The reason why this was so prolific is Log4j is open source, so it's used in a huge amount and variety of applications. Again, similar to the print nightmare, the issue with this vulnerability with Log4j was it allowed the execution of remote code. This time, you didn't even need to be on a network. Because the way Log4j actually logged through applications produced by Java are usually web-based applications. So remotely executed code without even having access to a network is what the Log4j vulnerability had. There was a huge scramble to get this patched and patched quickly. And everybody was going, what applications have Log4j? If you were ever to look at the actual applications that use the Log4j tool, it's huge. Everything right down to soft phones to web-based um, e-commerce solutions. All use the Log4j. All use that. So again, this was just one of those exploits and vulnerabilities that was identified. Uh, the next one I'd like to talk about is actually one that was only recent. It's the 7-zip vulnerability. You know what 7-zip is? Yeah, it's used for you know, extracting archives. This vulnerability is only about three or four weeks old. Um, again, this vulnerability has been identified. However, there's neither a patch nor a replication of the vulnerability published as yet. When I say a replication of the vulnerability, they have identified the vulnerability, but they haven't actually publicly said what the vulnerability is and how to reproduce it. But they know what the vulnerability is. The vulnerability here is there's a help file within 7-zip that you can drop any DLL into and run executed code. Now, even though this vulnerability has been identified with 7-zip, there's potentially a, a bigger issue here because the 7-zip help file relies on what we call the HHEXE. It's in most help files for applications. Windows-based applications all use this. This hh.exe basically just chucks out a, a chm file, which is essentially a help file. The actual vulnerability here is, again, it allows remote code execution and escalated privileges on the machine. So these are the actual vulnerabilities that are, are, are around. So when we talk about CVEs, there's quite a lot of them. Um, in fact, when we talk about CVEs, 90% of your active applications that you use day in and day out actually have some sort of CVE attached to them. Now, a lot of these would have been patched. However, when it comes to patching, it normally takes, the, on average, 34 days to patch a system. On average of 34 days. So that's 34 days where someone is vulnerable to each and every one of these CVEs. So while that vulnerability is there, every environment is open to these attacks. And when it comes to CVEs, what we're looking at is why are, are we concentrating on CVEs essentially here? Well, it's another attack vector for attackers. It's just opening up the vector of where we are vulnerable. And threat actors are using these CVEs. So why are they using them? Well, it all boils down to money. Everything boils down to money. 
Now, it's not just, okay, we're gonna look at a vulnerability. There's a hole here and we can ro run remote execution of code. It's not just ransomware that they're using or malware. Believe it or not, they're actually using these vulnerabilities to install crypto miners on machines. Silent crypto miners. Think about it. A Bitcoin today is 26,000 euro. You see a vulnerability and you're able to deploy a crypto miner silently on a couple of thousand machines. Well, you're harvesting a lot of money then over the space of a couple of weeks. And that's what they're doing. But it's not just about actually looking at vulnerabilities. It's looking about how they actually use these vulnerabilities or how they deploy these vulnerabilities. So threat actors are essentially changing the way that they deploy these vulnerabilities or use them to their advantage. So here I can see the ways that they're innovating. So instead of actually going after individual machines, over the last couple of years, they've sort of changed and morphed. It's if we go after the tools that manage these machines, we can actually attack a lot more machines by just attacking the ones that manage them. So in recent years, we've had issues with SolarWinds, a remote management tool, and Kaseya, again, remote management tool, both infiltrated to deploy malware to their endpoints that they were managing. So e each of these companies would have been managing thousands upon thousands of endpoints, if not millions, when they were infiltrated. The likes of rubber duckies. It's a strange one, but they are being used. Do we know what a rubber ducky is? So essentially what a rubber ducky is, for anybody that doesn't know what it is, it's essentially a USB stick. Looks like a USB stick, acts like a USB stick. For all intents and purposes, it is a USB stick. When it's plugged into a machine, it shows up as a storage device. However, hidden within the hardware of the USB stick, there's actually a driver. It's actually picked up on by the machine as a keyboard and it executes code on the machine without the user ever seeing it. Now, how would you deploy a rubber ducky? It's very simple. Just put a label on it, write payroll, drop it outside somebody's office. It's people's nature to be curious. That's how they do it. In fact, there was an employee in Tesla offered $500,000 to plug a rubber ducky into their uh, mainframe only last year. Thankfully, they asked the wrong person and it was reported um, to the police at the time. So when we're talking about how they're innovating and, and what we're actually up against, it's not just that the tools that they're using, it's actually who we're up against when it comes to these vulnerabilities. Long gone are the days of, you know, a hacker being a spotty teenager in a dark bedroom writing individual code. That's gone. That's gone. We're in the world of everything as a service these days. And you can't purchase ransomware as a service. You go onto the dark web and sign up to a ransomware service and get all the tools that they use just for a monthly subscription. You know, we're up against, you know, large corporations now worth millions and millions. That's what they do. That's how they make their money. Not only that, we've seen recently in Europe with the start of the Ukrainian war, a new introduction of the hermetic wiper. Basically, the hermetic wiper malware was basically a destruction malware. It's designed to, to destruct data disks for devices. All of the government agencies of, of Ukraine were actually attacked with this particular malware. Now, there's nowhere to say that where this malware actually initially came from, but we can all imagine and guess where it originated from. So the question is, how can we solve this problem? We know about the problems, but how can we solve it? So for any of those that have actually experienced ransomware or dealt with ransomware or attacks, we look at the traditional tools that we're using. Traditionally, what we're using is antiviruses, AV scanning, threat hunting, ransomware detection, 
next generation antiviruses with AI. All of these tools are designed to detect vulnerabilities in your environment, to detect the bad guy. All of these tools use a set of tools that they know about already. They need to know about what is good or bad in your environment for them to determine whether it's good or bad. So to put it this way, the way they work is they need to know the bad guy before letting them in. The problem is that they don't work. They don't work. And the reason why they don't work is because we know they don't work. Because ransomware is still rapid out there. Vulnerabilities are still rapid out there. When it comes to these detection tools, if I explain it in, in plain terms, it's like purchasing a, a new alarm system for your house that has motion sensors, laser detections everywhere, and then you walk out and leave your front door unlocked. It's not covering everything. We, we know that the, these guys are getting in. So when we look at it, there is a solution to how we actually manage all this. What I'd like to introduce is what we call the security triangle. Okay? When it comes to security, we break it down into this triangle. So if you have a look at the triangle here, on the left-hand side are all of these tools that we have that exist at the moment. Okay? These are our threat hunting, our, our antivirus, scanning for known vulnerabilities. This is what we have. Generally, if a system is attacked, we actually deploy more of these tools. Let's get a better EDR, a bigger EDR, bigger MDR. These are these tools. At the bottom of the security triangle here, we've got security awareness training. Now, I've been 20 years in the industry, I've done security awareness training. It doesn't work. Why does it not work? Because it works for 99% of the people. But there's always that one Doris in accounts that clicks on everything. When you tell her, don't click on anything, she will click on it. So we know that that doesn't work either. Where generally we're lacking is, is on the control side of this triangle. When you look at controls, we started adopting controls very easily. Everyone has firewalls. We know that we need a firewall. Recently, with the adoption of you know, MFA, two-factor authentication, we've seen a huge increase in that. And the thing with MFA and two-factor authentication is, it's the only thing that actually prevents a phishing attack. It's the only thing. It's the easiest thing to implement and the best solution for phishing attacks. Doesn't matter if anybody gets your credentials, if you have two-factor authentication enabled, you've stopped that from progressing. Where we're also lacking is when it comes to the actual endpoints themselves, is controlling what happens on the endpoints. So what Threat Locker does and, and what we, we do to prevent these controls or uh, Im implement these controls is we add another layer to the control side of it. So application whitelisting. Control the applications that you trust in your environment. Deny everything else. Bring fencing. Of those applications you have allowed in your environment, control what they can and cannot do. Don't let them do everything. Control them. Storage control. Control your data and what applications have access to your data. And privileged access management. Elevation control. Remove those local administrative, administrative accounts from your environment completely. Okay. What we're looking at is a zero trust approach, least privilege. We're going to give each user the least amount of privileges to do their job and give the applications the least amount of privileges that they need. The less privileges, the more we have reduced our attack vector, the more we have secured our environment. So just to go through that again, what we're saying is, application whitelisting. Control the applications that run in your environment and deny everything else. Not just applications, deny the executions of files and processes because anything can execute in your environment. Okay? Ring fencing, which is basically, we're gonna allow applications to run our environment, but let's control what they can and cannot do. So does Microsoft Office need to be able to interact with PowerShell? It doesn't, so let's stop that. Typical ransomware and malware attacks will all use what the tools that we use every day. The likes of Office attachments, 
Word files, Excel files. This is what they'll use. In the back end, they'll use callouts to PowerShell to download payloads and malware. That's what they'll use. So we're going to control that, and we're going to stop that from happening. There's certain applications that you can't block in a, a typical Windows environment, the likes of PowerShell. However, PowerShell is used in over 80% of ransomware attacks to either install the payload or to exfiltrate your data. As you can probably hear from my voice, I'm Irish from Dublin. One of the biggest ransomware attacks in the state of Ireland happened only just at the start of COVID. Our, our, our health service executive was completely crippled. Completely crippled. Basically, what it reduced was doctors and nurses with a pen and paper. Every single system was shut down completely. Why was it shut down? Because of the Conti V3 attack. The Conti V3 attack was a ransomware that attacked the whole infrastructure of the health service. What did it use? PowerShell. PowerShell to down pa download payloads. PowerShell to remove all the shadow copies of all the backups. PowerShell to deploy COBOL strikes. It used the applications that were there. So when we're talking about ring fence and we're talking about locking down the applications we have allowed, does PowerShell need access to all of my data? No, it doesn't. Why would PowerShell need access to my data? Okay, Windows needs it to run, but it need, doesn't need access to any of my local data. Doesn't need access to my documents. Doesn't need access to my file server. Doesn't need access to any of that. So let's block all that. So even if my machine wants to be infiltrated, well, PowerShell cannot actually access any of that. Okay. Elevation control. Again, privileged access management. Remove the need for local administrative accounts from each and every environment. So we, we're going to take away that control. So even if something wants to get in, they don't have the privilege to do anything. Even an end user doesn't have the privilege to do anything. So we're going to just stop that and remove that from happening. Storage control. Control what applications have access to your data. Remember, in a Windows environment, every single application that you run has access to your data because it's running under your user account. So if you have access to your financial information in your company, but so does Google Chrome have access to that data. Does it need access to that data? No, it doesn't. So we can control what access has that to our storage. Typically, a good example would be our backup in our environments. We all run backups. That's fine. That's what we're supposed to do. But let's control what has access to that backup. In any environment, there's only one thing that needs to have full read-write access to the backup, and that's the actual backup solution software. Nothing else needs access to that. So if you can control that right down to that level of that application, it doesn't matter what endpoint within the environment, if it does get infiltrated, is infiltrated, because it cannot damage that data. Because that's, that's the first thing an infiltrator will go for, is the backup solution because you're 90% more likely to pay off from ransomware if they have attacked it. So we're talking about how things change and how we can protect ourselves. So just before I finish, I'd like to always go through this, which is actually a genuine chat copy. This is a chat for a customer who was previously the victim of ransomware. As I said, it's no longer that geeky teenager in a bedroom. They very helpfully actually give them a voice on how to prevent this in the future. That's how good they are. Very speedily reply to them and very politely reply to them. Because it's not personal, it's a business. And it's just a transaction to them. That's all it is. So when we come to actually securing applications, it's about changing how we think about it how we think about actually securing everything. So what we're saying is, let's change how we view endpoint security. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Um, if you'd like to speak with us, myself and my colleague are outside, you can always um, book a demo if you'd like to for further information. Hey, thank you.